you've all heard that story, the one about the veteran game developers going indie, leaving their publishers to crowdfund a spiritual successor to the thing you loved as a kid. There's a lot of different versions of the story, some more tragic than others, but not one has been as ongoing as the case of Platonic and Ukulele. What was promised to be a successor to Banjo-Kazooie created by the same people was met with lukewarm reception. Some people hated it, others kinda liked it, me, I'd struggle to call it a bad game, but the confusing and bloated level design held it back for sure. I thought it was okay. It had great characters, a great moveset, good ideas, but the execution felt aimless and rough. Regardless, it wasn't the Banjo-Kazooie that people were hoping for, just an okay thing by the same people all of these years later, and most people thought that's where the story ended. They made their thing, and that was that. But as it turns out, Platonic has been wasting no time since Ukulele's launch. A sort of sequel, Ukulele and the Impossible Layer, kind of came out of nowhere. Nobody really expected a follow-up like this, let alone one in a different genre. What was once a Banjo-styled collectathon platformer was now a 2D side-scroll more akin to that of Donkey Kong Country. I guess it made sense though, those DK games are loved dearly, and rare was the studio behind them after all. I did find this somewhat surprising though, using the exact same characters to make a very different kind of game. Like I imagine they would just do Tukulele or Ukulele 2 or whatever, you know, just take another stab at giving everybody the banjo game that they wanted, but no, it seems like they're taking a very different approach here. The thing about making a Donkey Kong styled game is that it means that they're no longer attempting to fill a void. Ukulele was conceptualized by the entire idea of making something that has not been made in a long time, but they still make 2D Donkey Kong games. Games. Nobody's really out there with a Thirsty Kong fever that recent titles can't quench. So this announcement rubbed me very differently. It seems less like they're trying to cater to a demand and more like they're kind of just making what they're more confident in making, something that they more strongly feel like they can get right. And from what I've been hearing, they did get it right. I've been hearing a lot of good things about this one. It seems the shift in genre is doing them wonders. It's sort of ironic considering that Banjo's genre shift was kind of a disaster. I am interested in seeing this for myself though, it's sort of like an opposite situation from last time where I heard everybody hated it, I want to see it for myself, here I'm hearing it's great and I want to see it for myself too, and you know, I may as well because Platonic was kind enough to send me a review copy for free for the Switch version, uh, I appreciate that a lot, especially considering that I kind of gave their previous game a very, like, lukewarm review, so hey, that shows confidence and that much is very admirable. Oh wow, that title screen is already an improvement. The first game was just logo on background, but this is much more inventive. You can lately soarin' through a portal in a book, which does a solid job of representing the game's motif of storybooks. This screen didn't really get much of that across. It didn't even really show the characters. I like this one a lot more. Capital B is Capital Back, and he's enslaved all of the bees in the Royal Stingdom using a mind control device called the Hive Mind. Okay, usually puns make me roll my eyes a little bit, but these ones are just so good. Like, they work really well. I mean, a hive mind, a beehive that controls minds? Come on, that's pretty clever. All these years later, and these guys still haven't lost their touch with wordplay. It won't be long into playing this thing that you'll start to notice the obvious comparisons to Donkey Kong. The two-character dynamic, except swapping Donkey and Diddy with Yuka and Laylee, the roll move that you can jump out of when falling off a ledge, and the general way that jumping on enemies looks and feels. We've got those cannons you'll fire in between, functioning exactly as they did in country, even down to the way collectibles sway back and forth for you to grab with good timing. Swimming functions closer to tropical freeze, however, with the character's orientation rotating as you glide through the water. Now, while it certainly has Donkey Kong things, it doesn't quite feel exactly like Donkey Kong. Uh, firstly, I always felt that 3D characters on a 3D plane that you can visibly see always has a distinctly different feel than games on an actual 2D plane. New Super Mario Bros, for example. It has has 3D models, yeah, but it feels closer to actual 2D Mario because the plane is still 2D. He's standing on the edge of the earth here, while in other 3D side-scrollers you can see a bit of depth, and I don't know if it's just in my head, but that style always felt slightly different to me. But either way, the point being, it feels more like Country Returns and Tropical Freeze than it does the classic 2D games, but even then the movement of these characters does feel unique from that as well. I'd say it's a little heavier, a little less nimble, which is a little weird, I'd imagine 
imagine a gorilla would have more weight than a chameleon, but yeah, it feels good, just not exactly the same as those games. Which is a really good thing if you ask me, because they don't need to completely recreate Donkey Kong, just use it as a blueprint and then create their own identity from there. I think that's for the best. And with that said, here's where things do get a little bit different. So uh, similar to having Diddy Kong with you in the Returns games, having Laylee with you will also grant extra moves. Firstly, there's a little twirl you can do mid-jump to extend your air time, similar to the uh, spin move in New Super Mario Bros. And there's also the Buddy Slam. At it again with that good old wordplay, it's a ground pound move. If you don't have Laylee with you, you won't be able to perform either of those actions, making getting through the level more challenging and making certain collectibles harder to get or straight up inaccessible. Now, the buddy system here actually works in reverse when compared to Donkey Kong. In those games, you'd start as DK with the base moves and later find Diddy to unlock more, a sort of like a power-up in a Mario game. You find it later and you have it as long as you don't get hit. Impossible Layer, however, begins each level with the duo already together. If you take a hit, Laylee will scamper off, giving you a chance to grab her, but if you wait too long, she'll fly off and you'll lose her. Think losing rings in a Sonic game. You get a brief moment to recollect some before they disappear. This initially stuck out to me as a sort of weird decision, like starting with the extra moves and only being able to lose them from there, but I suppose you could view it as starting with a complete move set and losing those moves being punishment for taking a hit, rather than extra moves being a reward. Taking damage won't kill you at first, but it will make those jumps slightly more challenging without the twirl, and it'll revoke access to certain coins, so the challenge now becomes in making it to those coins without getting hit. And that is an interesting way of doing it, it is totally viable, but the problem I had with it is that dying has you respawn with Laylee again, so there were times I would die on purpose just to cheaply get her back. It's a little flawed, but I don't hate it. Each step they take in making this thing feel distinct from Donkey Kong is a step in the right direction in my eyes. And you don't get more distinct than this game's core concept. The first level you play is actually the final level, the impossible layer. But of course, you're not going to get far before you're super duper dead. It is hard as hell, so that's why you're probably going to want to complete the game's 20 levels to make the layer easier first. Each level you'll complete, you'll rescue one of these bees, and each bee gives you one more hit point for the impossible layer. So, for example, let's say you finished five levels, that means you can take five hits there. But if you collect all 48, you can take a whopping 48 hits before you're donezo. This counts for falling off of ledges too. They put you back on solid ground, and that counts as one hit. So, I know what you're thinking. How are there 48 bees if there's only 20 levels? Well, that level count actually becomes double when you take this game's other central gimmick into account. Every level on the overworld has a secondary version of it you can play by doing something to the storybook, and it's always something different. For example, flooding the book with water will create a flooded version of the level. This one here, you turn the book on its side, and now you have to replay the entire level sideways, climbing to the top instead of running to the right. This powered down factory level becomes fully functioning and operational after zapping the book with some electricity. They create versions of these levels that are so different they're sometimes barely recognizable. It's a really cool idea. Honestly, this is downright brilliant. They played around with the idea of changing the book to change the level in the original ukulele, but every time it only made the level bigger. Having a totally different thing for every single level is way more interesting. There's so many creative ways that they alter these levels, and half of the fun is figuring out what you can do in the overworld that'll affect the storybook. That's another thing I was really surprised by. Every video I've watched about this game swears the overworld is like the best part of the game, but looking at it, it's like, I don't know, it just kind of looks like Mario 3D World's overworld. You can't jump very high, kind of just walk around, I don't know. It doesn't really look all that interesting. But no, I guess it is just one of those things that looks way less exciting than it really is. Exploring this map and finding all the little secrets and doing the puzzles was a blast. This is what Mario 3D World's overworld should have been. There's a bunch of those hidden bees you can rescue on the map here, and stumbling upon them was immensely satisfying. Some of these you can find through secret exits in certain stages, very Mario World. But this one here, I found a way to skip the level and bugger my way up there with this bridge mechanism. I felt like a freaking genius figuring that out. You can also find these pages that give you a little bonus level to play, and when you beat that, you'll unlock a new chunk of the overworld. These bonus levels look really ugly. Like, they kind of look like they were made in the freaking Stage Maker in Smash Bros. But uh, yeah, this is definitely the part of the game that harnesses that exploratory spirit that the first game had, but it's a lot more legible and easy to digest here. Instead of a huge, sprawling, and empty-ish map, this is an overworld that is tightly packed. It's not very big, but more importantly, they make very good use of the small space they created. Everything feels like it has a purpose. There's no space that's just there for the sake of making the world bigger. I think a good example I can think of is uh, thinking about Termina versus Hyrule on N64. 
A Hyrule was impressive at the time for its size, but it was big and empty and took a long time to get across. Termina, on the other hand, is smaller, but there's more things to do, and it takes a lot less time to navigate. It's really cool seeing these developers recognize that and design this map with that newfound experience. Another cool thing this game has is tonics. These are little modifiers that make slight changes to the gameplay. You can find them hidden on the overworld, and then after that, you can then purchase them with all the quills you find. A lot of these are filters for the screen, which I never really saw the purpose of because I can just do most of this by playing with the settings on my television. Most of them will actually affect the gameplay though, making the game either easier or more challenging. Some examples here, uh, this one removes Yuka's tail so he can't tail whip anymore, uh, this one increases your twirl time giving you even more air and distance, uh, this one swaps a bunch of the buttons on the controller around decimating your muscle memory, and this one slows down time making levels a lot easier to get through. Depending on whether or not you made the game easier or harder, you'll then be given a quill multiplier that'll either dock or add more quills when you beat a level. So if you want to unlock more tonics and you want to get more quills to do that, you might want to jack up the difficulty and play levels that way. But if you want to cruise more smoothly at the expense of getting less quills, you can do that as well. My go-to one was not losing twit coins when you die. That one was super helpful. Easily worth the docked quills for some of these levels. Oh right, the twit coins. I almost forgot about those. Uh, they very much remind me of the star coins in New Super Mario Bros. When you collect one, it tells you which one it is, so you get a good idea of where in the level to look if you missed one. These are used to open up more areas in the overworld, giving them a trouser to get through literal paywalls. Yeah, that is what they call them. It's always fun to see games taking shots at annoying business practices. I love how they're called twit coins too, like as if you have to be a total twit to give this guy your money. While these coins feel very new Super Mario, the way quills function actually reminds me a lot of Rayman Origins. There's also a handful of different types of these ghost quills, these uh, pickle rick looking ass dudes. A touch and one will have it move and spawn a bunch of quills, and getting them all in in a lot of time will give you even more on top of that. I know Donkey Kong did something similar to this, but the very specific way these things act and move really seems to harness that utmost goofiness you see the lums from Rayman Origins and Legends have. It's pretty interesting noticing little things like that, which I think is a very good thing, because it shows that while Donkey Kong is the meat and potatoes of this game's inspiration, they are likely taking influence from a lot of other stuff as well. I really like the general aesthetic of this game, the way you go from more organic and nature-like settings to more industrial and factory settings. The music is always super good too. Wise and Kirk Hope join on for the soundtrack again, and they do an amazing job as always. But let's not forget to give love to Dan Murdoch and Matt Griffin as well. These guys brought together a wonderful soundtrack for this thing. This game's got a good share of personality as well. The writing has that expected British zing to it, and Yuka and Laylee continue to have very appealing designs. The little sounds Laylee makes are kind of adorable, and I love how doofy Yuka looks when he's got an object in his mouth. I can't understand you. Please, you're gonna choke on that thing. Oh my god. Once you have a bunch of bees, the impossible layer is still no easy task. Once I had all of them, I only got 50% through on my first attempt. It's one of those things that's very rewarding to play again and again, each time getting further and further. They even have these adorable little balloons to mark where you died last time, and getting to one of those and thinking, oh, I have tons of bees left here this time, you feel yourself getting better and better until you finally conquer it. It's genuinely challenging, and I absolutely loved it. I actually think this is one of my favorite final levels in a 2D platformer in a long time. This game really surprised me. I was not expecting to like it this much. Like, I thought it was just gonna be okay or average or mediocre, but no, like this is actually pretty dang good. I guess sometimes instead of giving us something we're all asking for, it's maybe better just to make something you're better at making. While ukulele was pretty much just an inferior and mediocre version of Banjo, in the way that I guess you could say that uh, Ant Dude is an inferior and mediocre version of Nitro Rad, Impossible Layer doesn't really feel like an inferior Donkey Kong. There's a lot of Donkey Kong in there, but Impossible Layer is an interesting reminder that there is a surprising amount of originality in the studio that was formed to make new games like old games. Well, since they're making new versions of old Rare properties with these two, it makes me wonder what's gonna be next. Maybe a GoldenEye successor? Let's get a first-person shooter starring ukulele. That would be cool. Huh? No? Yeah, it probably wouldn't work too well. What about, like, a Jet Force Gemini? No. 
Ukulele racing. Give me those planes, those hovercrafts, bring it all back with ukulele. Dude, that would be dope. I would still like to see them take another stab at the 3D collectathon sometime. Like, a ukulele that takes all of the constructive criticism into account is very much something I would like to see. But honestly, it's probably for the best that instead of trying to cater to fan demand, they just make whatever they're confident in. Because as it stands, it's pretty clear that's how you make the better games. So, here's some more Platonic stuff. I'm going to be very interested in seeing what they put out next, whether it's something we expect them to do or something a little more surprising. Yo, what's up? Welcome to the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching the whole thing. If you're interested in supporting the channel, uh, Brady and I have a podcast over on Patreon. That is $1 a month. Also, if you'd like to follow me on Twitter, you can do that. I'm on Twitter a lot. Uh, what else? You can also click... Uh,